Hello, everybody. How are you, beautiful people? <laughs> um, <clears throat> today I got something really neat, actually. Um, the awesome people at Tycon sent me this Tycon Industrial Switch. This is the, uh, where's the nameplate here? It's a TPSW8GAT slash BT slash 24SFB. Okay. I honestly can't remember if I did the unboxing video for this, but eh, whatever. This will be a little bit more, um, good. This will be more good. Anyway, let's take a look what this thing has. <clears throat> so this is a DIN rail mount, and yes, I already took de chassis it, so it was easier for me to do a quick video for you guys. Um, so this thing's DIN rail mountable, and it's got a great little DIN system on it. Plus, it's got ears on here, which you can actually flip around, so if you want to shelf mount this, you can take off this bracket, flip these guys out, and then screw it into your shelf. Um, in fact, uh, I'll take a second to do that, because uh, why not? I'm probably actually gonna DIN mount this myself, uh, afterwards for a lab project that we're doing which will be a great way to demonstrate how awesome this little switch is um so as you guys know tycon's been making all sorts of awesome stuff for the telecom industry from uh rectifiers to switches and the solar like off-grid type plant stuff wind turbines they make all sorts of great stuff um they're a really awesome company actually and um so i am actually honored that they would send me equipment not once but twice to bring to the market for you so here, look at this little ear on here now. You can see this. See? This is very well thought out. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> let's take a look what's on the front of this thing. All right. So I got to focus on here for now. So this thing comes with uh, two SFP ports. They aren't SFP plus. They're just SFPs. But hey, that's awesome because you can do a lot with an SFP. Like, for example, if you wanted to stick this in an enclosure at the top of a tower, which seems to be a very common problem for everybody, is that... Uh, <coughs> Uh, that's just from dinner. Don't worry. And I got a minor head cold. Anyway, you can stick this in an enclosure at the top of a tower, which Tycon also make these enclosures. You can also run 54 volts uh, with cabling up to number 12 AWG up the tower with fiber. And then that allows you to connect eight radios. <clears throat> now here's the cool thing. You can actually plug in two BT radios. So this is gonna take two BT radios, or it'll also take, um, Let's see here, we can do passive on these four. So these guys, so let's me, I'll just read this off for you. Ports one and two allow you to do passive, okay? A three and four are 802.3BT, and then five through eight are standard PoE, okay? Mm -hmm. So now what this allows you to do is you can run a BT capable radio. <clears throat> so what do you think heavy? Like an Air Fiber 24 is an example, or maybe an Aviat or Saragon or Cichlu, like uh, anything that requires BT, you can run off of this. So you can put two backhauls on here that are heavy duty, and then you've got plenty of space on here for other things. So, and they do have different switches. This is just one. This is just the eight port. Go check out their product lineup. I'll leave a link below. Um, but anyway, so yeah, this is great for just a small site. I'll give you an example. Four sectors here on the AT ports. You can hook up four EPMP 3000s, and then you've got the two BT ports here for backhaul uh, to come through. And then two passive ports on here, say for a couple of subsites where you wanted to hook up a couple of small dishes to feed a couple of micro pops. So lots of options. You can do a lot of this stuff. Now this is a managed switch, by the way, and I believe uh, it is capable of 20 gigabits per second on the back plane, which is way more. Let me see here. Yeah, let's take a look at it. Let's jump into the the stats before we get into the guts. Okay, so let me just uh, focus this. Mm. I'm gonna figure out a way to automate the focus, by the way. Auto focus is no bueno. No. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Let's start, actually start at the top of this, okay? So what do we got here? <clears throat> so ports, one and two configurable is 802.3 AF, AT, or 24 volt passive PoE, 30 watts. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. Three and four configura configurable is 802.3 AF, AT, which is your standard PoE, or BT, which is 90 watts, okay? Mm -hmm. Five through eight are 30 watts AFAT. And let's see here. Uh, console port, uh, it'll take, oh, alarm input will be five to 57 volts DC, that's handy. <coughs> Excuse me. Alarm relay output, up to 60 volts, three amp switching. Uh, and of course it has the temperature and humidity probe, which plugs into the side here. Plugs in right there. I'm pretty sure that I demonstrated that in the first video. I placed it at the side here, so that's, that's my mulligan there. Give me a second here, I'll grab it for you guys. Two hours later. Oh no, that is embarrassing. I'll take a mulligan on that one. I literally set this whole bench up beforehand 
with all the stuff for this, including little... It's with the cable, I know that. There's the cable. There's the cable right there, but where the hell is the thermal probe? Huh. No big deal. Don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so anyway, it comes with this awesome little um, cable right here. This little um, three pin. Now, this cable here, I believe that it's about three feet long. So what this is for is that on the side here, you've got your port for a, um, a thermal probe slash humidity probe. Um, so this guy here will allow you to keep an eye on how your enclosure looks. So if water gets in or anything like that, you can be aware of that, okay? Uh, let's see here. LEDs, PoE protection. This is cool. So this guy here, uh, P over voltage, over current, and short circuit, just like any other regular industry PoE switch. You know what I'm saying about that. Pretty much every PoE switch passive or active has port protection on it. Okay, so anyway. That'll ensure that your switch doesn't blow up and neither do your radios. PoE pinout. Uh, let's see here. This is basically just your pinouts on here for what the uh, port is, blah, blah, blah. Surge protection, 6 kilovolts, normal mode, 2 kilovolts, differential mode. Okay. okay. ESD protection, 15 kilovolts, air, 8 kilovolts, touch. Nice. Oh, Management, web, CLI, Telnet, SSH, and SNMP. This is a full-featured managed switch, by the way. Designed for industrial application, but most of our stuff is in, uh, industrial, okay? VLANs supports up to 4,094 active VLANs simultaneously. Uh, Port-based VLAN 802.1Q, AD, Q and Q tunneling, private VLAN protected port GARP GVRP. So this thing will literally do every type of VLAN. Um, <clears throat> port management. Let's see here. PoE enable, disable, blah, 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 reboot, uh, power budget, port priority. Power limitations, classifications, detect PD, a live check, PoE scheduling. And it's fully featured as far as spanning tree goes, because this will not only do STP, but RSTP and MSTP. Um, so with multiple spanning tree, MSTP, if you're running a layer 2 network, which I encourage you not to if you're a wireless ISP, this guy here is more than capable of handling multiple paths over layer 2. Um, so this is actually a really decent little switch here. Da -da -da -da. Right there. Okay, so what else we got here? <clears throat> it supports ring network protocol, ERPS, Ethernet ring protection switching. Uh, so that's G.8032 ERPS ring. I honestly haven't played with that yet, but it's something which I really want to. It sounds really neat. Oh, okay. That's neat. And I think that the way they were explaining it to me is that uh, this is for when you create loops, literal rings in your networks with your switches. Um, this will actually allow you to run that ring and be able to elect your paths and not have to worry about uh, developing loops, if you know what I mean. Like, uh, you know, detrimental loops. All right, what else we got on here that I need to talk about before I can actually get into the fun stuff? Mac management, add, delete, Mac address, learning, limit, uh, dynamic aging, time settling, blah, 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 layer three switching functions. Yeah, virtual LAN interface, ARP, static router. What? Static router. Hold on, this is a layer three switch? I just realized that. I didn't realize that this was a layer three switch. Are you <laughs> me? Well, we're gonna find out more about that because I might be misreading that. I really might be misreading that. So, but it says layer three switching functions, virtual LAN interface, ARP and static router. I don't think it'll, it means that it can do OSPF or anything like that. So let's see here, access control list, quality of service, which is pretty standard. This is all very standard stuff that's necessary to run a proper network. Anti-attack support, DOS, defense, CPU protection, limit message send rate, ARP binding, IP, MAC, other functions. Hey, here's something else that's great about this little switch. It supports LLDP, Link Layer Discovery Protocol, which means that you can discover this with all of your devices, whether they're Ubiquiti, um, Cisco, Juniper, anything that supports LLDP, this thing can be discovered. Handy, very, very handy. And here, we've stored something that'll really come in handy if it doesn't fall out and break my leg. <laughs> Let's see here, so it's LLDP, SNMP, blah, 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 regular stuff, upgrade management. Switching capacity is 20 gigabits per second, full jumbo frames at 9216. How much packet, a packet forwarding on the switch fabric here? 14.88 uh, mega packets per second at 64 bytes. So this thing's a tank. We got a tank. Um, let's see here, forwarding, store and forward, packet cache, four megs, RAM flash, one gig, 128. Uh, address table, network protocol supported. Hmm. Okay, so this does all the regular switch protocols. Let's see here. You can pause it and take a look at this, or you can look at the data sheet, because, I mean, like, this does everything the switch is supposed to do. It a little bit more. <clears throat> 
good from negative 40 to plus 75 Celsius, which is pretty standard for any kind of uh, hardened equipment. Otherwise, you can't run it. This is designed to run in really harsh conditions. 5% to 95% non-condensing, which means that the vapor can be in the air, but as soon as it starts to condense into water droplets, you're in trouble. The mean time before failure is 50,000 hours, and it's fully certified CE, FCC, uh, ROHS, and it comes in at just about two pounds. I should check that. Uh, let me just blow the crumbs off of this scale. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't weighing out pounds of stuff earlier. Let's change this into freedom units. 1.7 with that, without the housing on it, eh? 1.12. And where did I put the other plate? Here it is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this will come in at around two. Let's put all of this on here. This thing is built like a tank, by the way. We got a tank. I shit you not. Okay, two pounds, eight ounces. Wait. Two pounds, 8.9 ounces. So that's everything there. Nice. And let's, let's change that back over to uh, what we know and love. 1.1 kilograms. Not bad. All right, what's that say on the data sheet? Yeah, two pounds or 0 0.9 kilograms. Cool. Nice. All right, so now, enough I think there's one more piece of data here that I need to look at. Yeah, that pretty much repeats everything that's on there. Let's get into the meat of this guy. This is a beautiful, beautiful switch, and I'm very, very excited to actually have my hands on it, to be honest. I am extremely excited, and <laughs> I can't kiss ass enough with Tycon for sending me this thing. Kiss ass. All right, so let's take a look at this thing. All right, let's uh, make sure the focus is perfect on that. There we go. Okay, so what do we have here? This is built like other well-built PoE switches, like passive PoE switches. This board here, this is actually power distribution. This is your PDU right here on top. Now, take a good look at this PDU, okay? Look at all the gas discharge um, tubes along here and look at all the MOVs. I believe that these are MOVs, they are. So we've got MOVs and GDTs. That's two layers of protection, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the difference is, is with GDTs, they typically, they don't fault shut they fault open, right? So when you've got um, GDTs in a circuit, that's why they're a little bit better. There are some switch manufacturers that if you use TVS or MOV type uh, surge suppression, that if they clamp, you're gonna pop the ports. Now, that's only one switch manufacturer that I know of. Um, as far as uh, everything else goes, GDTs will fault open, so eventually they just won't work anymore. We're gonna put that to the test at some point, by the way. I have made a machine for that. Now, the MOVs here are the same thing. They'll kind of fault shut, uh, but they'll take a lot more hits. So usually with MOVs, you've got a fuse, an inline fuse with them to um, uh, protect the circuit. So they can take a hell of a punch and then pop the fuse. So this has a lot of heavy port protection already built into it. And in fact, there's also power protection on the input, which is great. And this thing actually has dual inputs and it looks like they're dual isolated inputs on here. Uh, now I wouldn't say fully isolated per se. Don't take me wrong uh, when I say that. It's just that these two inputs are actually sort of isolated and protected from each other so that if there's a fault on one, the other one will continue to operate. And that's through this circuitry right here. Okay, now everything inside of this is modular, which is awesome because if something pops, it's easy to pop it out, repair it or replace it, okay? But look at this power distribution board. This is actually very well built, very, very nicely designed, very, very clean. And what I love about these switches is the amount of care that goes into building them, okay? I just realized I dropped the F-bomb earlier and I shouldn't have. This is a sponsored video. We'll, we'll have to beep that out. I'll let, uh, I'll let the editor take care of that. <laughs> yeah, that's why we have editors is because I'm terrible. All right, so let's look at this now. Here's our caps on the bottom. I don't know why they're orientated like that. I mean, like they should. My OCD monkey brain says do this. So I don't know if that was in shipping, if they were dropped or slammed by uh, UPS. And yes, I, I will name UPS like that because it's not the first time I've had issues with them. So let's take this out now and let's get in here. Okay, so what do we got here? So here's our magnetics here. So I've got four. So each one of these are handling two ports. Um, this is the, we've got a little real tech chip right here. From the looks of things, that may actually be the console interface. That's a serial interface chip. So now what have we got over here? So we've got our power uh, section right here. Kind of goes along the back here. And then of course it's going to carry up through one of these headers up to the power board here. Beautiful, sexy power board, by the way. There is a lot of filtering going on here. This is actually a very clean board. This is very, very pure power going to the ports on here, even though it already is DC by origin. 
I love that there's a GDT on the actual power input on this guy as well. Let's take it apart even more. I'm glad that this is so much easier to take apart and put together than the uh, other thing which I was working on. Which, actually, I've already done take one on the teardown video for the other one. And I realized afterwards that I made a grave mistake. Because thanks to one of you guys in the forum, I posted some pictures on it. And uh, I realized that I might have mislabeled one of the chips. And so I'm going to redo that video. Um, because I don't want to post anything that's got any kind of false information in it. It's got to be to the best of my knowledge. We have a screw somewhere and I'm not seeing it. Oh, it's thermal compound. There's a big sticky gooey pad underneath here, isn't there? Um, or it might also be these guys. Nope, it doesn't look like those ones are, oh, this one's adhered. Okay, so let me get my little socket set. I believe those ones are, what, four mil? That's five mil, okay. Handy little kits. I got this at my local Canadian Tire. It cost me a grand total of $17 on sale, normally 45. Is that the only one I need to remove? No, I think this one too. No, that's got a bolt on the back of it, or a nut on the back of it. There we go. Okay, so I should be able to get this out now. Is there a secret to you and how I remove you? Do I have to take the faceplate off? No, I shouldn't. This is a puzzle. It's welded along there. Theoretically, I should just be able to fiddle this. Here we go. Nice. If you guys like cartoons like me, you might actually know that meme. Nice. Nice! All right, let's see here. All right, so we've got the board out now. What a sexy piece of equipment. Um, so it looks like we've got our flash drive here. Uh, there is our BIOS right there. I think that this is actually the RAM and flash. I'm not sure, but we'll flip it over and find out. So let's take a look in the back here. Now what do we got here? Is this another Realtek chip? Now look at this, by the way. This is really clever. See, we've got like thermal conductive padding uh, underneath the, what are we underneath of? So under this inductor and under the actual uh, CPU for this bad boy. Now let me just see how this is adhered. Thermal silicone. So I can probably peel that chip off, but I don't believe that that's going to be necessary because one, I don't want to have to glue all this back together. Uh, and two, we already have all the specs on this. And realistically, because it is actually a Linux device, if we want to, maybe once I do the software, I'll see if I can get into the back end of it and actually find out what the chip is without actually having to delid this guy because it's just, uh, it's a work of art. And I've uh, destructively explored too many things already. Okay, so by the way, I want you guys to take a good look at this. Look at how clean the board is. Now, I appreciate something like that because uh, we'll go back to the Y-Tech switch. When I was examining the Y-Tech switch, there was port, like there was pin contamination from loose solder beads um, all over the place. There was shorts on pins. There was flux and like residue all over the board. That's disgusting. Gross. But look at this, this is proper engineering. This is proper build, right? Look at how clean that is. It's sterile, I mean like, I can stick my tongue on that thing right now. So let's take a look at the back of it, okay? So looking at the back here, all right, so we've got our, we have here, I should actually get those chips and find out what they are. It looks like this one might have been lapped though, so I don't think I can actually read what's on there, but I believe that this is the voltage regulator for the uh, SFPs. Let's see here, maybe, maybe not. Let's see what we got here. See, this is the power input right here. Okay, and then we've got this real tech chip over here. And then we got this other little chip right here. You know what that might actually be? That might be for the... Ah, hold on, it goes to this header right here, which... Okay, so that's what that's for. That's the interface chip for the uh, temperature and hydrometer. Cool. Or is it humidity? No, it's a hydrometer, right? For measuring humidity, hydrometer. I hate that I'm getting dumber. It really sucks. Um, ah, environmental. IP40. Whatever. By the way, this is a really power efficient switch. It only uses like two watts running, and I did check that on my bench uh, power supply, so. Well built. I don't know what else I can say about this little bad boy. She's very well built. You've got your serial, serial interfacing on it, uh, two SFPs, and all the other wonderful ports. And uh, something to note. I want to bring this up right now. I notice here, it's got a barrel connector off the back of it. Hmm. Hmm. That's a spot for a barrel connector. Really? And it looks like it's missing a couple of diodes, but that could be assembled to actually work. But there's no point because it's got a Phoenix connector on the side of it. So whatever, right? All right, so anyway, look at the thermal coupling on this. We're gonna put this guy back together. 
So like not only does it have a little heat sink, but it's also got the thermal conductive pads to help wick the heat away from this into the chassis. And if you'll take a close look here, here's the primary housing right here, right? Then you got these bad boys. So this thing has a lot of thermal mass to it, right? Is that not cool? I like this. God, I'm trying so hard to not to swear. I know you guys love it when I swear, but I can't swear in sponsored content. It's just rude, especially if the uh, sponsors want to use that content for their own advertising purposes. So please bear with me. I am struggling. All right, let me get my favorite screwdriver here. This thing's amazing. Everybody should have one of these. Let me just zoom out again. Here we go. This, this little screwdriver will get into anything. It's a Phillips and it's just amazing. And let me just get this in here like so. Here we go. Boop, 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 boop. I think this came with something I bought from like uh, Ikea or something. I can't remember, but it, uh, it came in a package or something and I never threw it out because I'm like, who the hell makes like a, a 10 inch friggin' Phillips screwdriver? Not many people. And how many times, and I'm sure you guys can all relate, how many times have you actually needed a super long Phillips screwdriver, right? See here, I think this is the one here. There we go. And where did I put the last one? Oh, that is all of them. One, two, three. Okay, and then this top board goes on. Let's see here. Be careful to line the headers up properly. There we go. Make sure everything's plugged in properly. Just a, this is just a work of art. Even like without the screws in it, this is just really solid. No, I'm not kissing ass, by the way. This is just... I'm very happy with this switch. This is a great switch. I wish I wasn't so absent-minded, but you guys get a kick out of that, don't you? I know you do. Okay, so let's see here. There we go. Boopity boop. That goes in right there. And then we put our little thermal probe. This is for the, yeah, this one's for the thermal probe and for the alarm goes right here. Is, it, is that the alarm? That's alarm in. Oh, this is alarm out. So this actually has an, a relay on it. It's a, uh, it's a little relay that allows you to tie it into an alarm panel. So if something goes on here, you've got supervisory action, which is really cool because let's just say this. Let's say that the switch locks up. The relay is gonna change states. So if this thing crashes or loses power or whatever, state changes and you can have that notify you through your ADT alarm panel or Bosch or whoever you guys are using for your alarm system. So you can also have additional supervisory action here other than your network supervise, uh, supervision. All right, let's see here. I'm gonna have to loosen this ear off. Yeah, that should do it. Okay, so I'm gonna put the sides in first. I'm really excited about the switch, by the way, because one of the cool things is, is that, as you guys know, I'm doing the Nightnet product reviews, which I know that I'm taking forever on it, but seriously, that's, it's coming. Just be patient, okay? You're just going to have to be patient. So, but here's the really cool thing, is that this switch here is fully capable of running a high power radio, like the Ignite Net products. In fact, I'll show you guys a couple of heavy duty PoE devices in a moment. Sure here, yes, there's two more on here. Okay, there we go. And then I would assume that the non-discriminate plate goes on the bottom. No screws are missing. Let's do this guy like so. And then we'll get this corner here. Boopity boop. God, I have a weird craving to play the video game Deceit. That was a great game. I haven't played that in a long time. I just noticed something here too, by the way. This is way longer than the other ones, isn't it? Or was it this one? Nope, these are all shorties. Okay, good. Are my eyes deceiving me again? I think they are. There we go. So we will uh, tighten these guys up. I'll show you something really, really neat in a second here. That's neat. Now the dual power in is actually really, really handy because you can actually, if you've got two switches up the tower, for example, you can give both the switches their own power feed but then you can also tie in the uh, secondary port from each one kitty corner so you can actually have this switch with its own power feed and this switch with this its own power feed and of course you want to have more power than needed but then you can also cross feed them into the secondary power inputs so that if there is a fault of any kind you can actually run the switch off of the secondary power feed being the other switch. Now, obviously you wanna put safe checks in place to ensure that if it's the switch that faulted, that it's not gonna take down the entire site. That just kinda of goes without saying, but you see the point there. Am I batting a thousand here or what? Eh, this is what happens when you're tired. There we go, I think we've got everything in there. Awesome, awesome possum. Let's do this. I'm actually going to, uh, this should be all the screws. Yeah, let's make sure of that. I know I'm, oh, there it is. Is that it? I think, let me try. That is not it. Um, oh, you know what I probably did? Sorry. I'm a scatterbrain and I do apologize. It's gonna be one of these ones. It's got short and long screws. There it is, right there, folks. There we go, and we're gonna put two. There it is, right there. Okay, now they're all in the right place. Ha ha ha. I guess you could say that I voided the warranty. I guess Tycon's not gonna be able to take this off back off me now. All right, so there we go. 
Okay, so that's all good. Let's see here. Now, here's the cool thing. So let's take a look at this now. So this will take 12 through 37 volts DC in. So you can run this as 24 volts only as a passive. So there's like, it's a managed switch, but it won't have any PoE functionality. But when you run it from 37 to 4, 57 volts DC, it'll activate PoE. Now, I'm going to assume, don't, don't, we're going to have to experiment with this, but anyway, that once you get it about 40 volts, the PoE will work perfectly fine because there's no boost conversion in it, I'm sure. There's probably regulation in it, which we will, we will test that. But I'm willing to bet that this thing relies on the fact that most PoE devices will work within the full swing voltage of a 48 volt site, which is, uh, what is it, like, so 44 to, or what is it, it'd be 40-ish, I think, all the way up to uh, 57. Because, you know, 37 to 57, that would be pretty close to full swing voltage of a completely flat AGM to a fully charged AGM um, or lithium cell. But this guy's all back together now, so let's give it some power. Now, I took the liberty of connecting this thing up to my bench power supply. And I want you to listen very, very carefully now when I hook up the power to this, because you're going to hear the alarm relay. Listen. Oh, it's way too quiet. Here, I'm going to unplug it. I'm going to hold this thing right up to here. You can hear it after the pop of my uh, power supply. You'll hear the little click. I try to get right against the microphone. There, you heard the little snap, right? I'll do it one more time. There you go. So that's the alarm relay. That's the alarm relay kicking in. That's it opening. It's activating. So, see what I mean? You can tie this thing into like an alarm panel, and then if there's any faults, what will happen is is that uh, the relay will return to its resting state, which is, uh, I what is it, normally open? Normally closed? Let's find out. Let's plug our, um, rather than look at the data sheet, let's just get a multimeter and take a look at this thing. Here we go. And in fact, you know what I should do? This would just be neat. Neat. Let me grab my super teeny tiny, stab myself in the hands all the time uh, probes here, and we'll demonstrate an alarm. There we go. Okay, so that's in there. Now I need to reconnect this. Okay, so what I should do is let's put the multimeter on. There we go. So that should be on continuity or diode. There we go. I'm gonna put these probes over here. Okay, cool. So that's open right now. Okay, so that's a typical alarm system. Now, let's see what happens when I give it power. You make a liar to me. Oh, I think I've got it backwards. There's a diode on it or something. No? It says alarm out plus alarm out minus. So there's a relay on that, but it's not dry contact. Interesting. I like experimenting with shit like this. And then there's the alarm in for like a door alarm, door sensor, so you can monitor that remotely. Let me just check something on here. Uh, connections. Oh, there we go. Took it a minute. That, oh, you know what it probably is? I'll bet you 10 bucks that it waits until it's actually active. Here we go. So once the actually, <laughs> what's happening here is that it actually waited, like once the CPU was active and this thing was actually running, like actually processing information, that's when the relay closed. So now if I cut the power, let's see what happens here. Should be dead by now. I don't, honestly don't know. Hmm. I'm not sure. We'll have to cut out that part I said about the alarm port. <laughs> Cause that's odd. Let me just try plugging this in. Here we go. Plugged in. Power's out. You know what though? Let's try this. I think I might know what's going on here. Cause it's got positive and negative listed on here. It might actually be a wet contact. And what a wet contact is, is a, uh, it puts out voltage. That would explain the relay type that's in there. So I'm gonna, this is polarity sensitive, so that should also be an indication that this is actually a uh, wet contact type interface. It's a wet interface, not dry. Okay, so there we go. So that is set for voltage now. Are we getting any voltage on here? No. Let's see what happens when we power it up. If it does anything. Let's see here. 
Um, God damn. Um, there's the alarm ports. Alarm input. Alarm output. Let's see what the alarm output says. This is cool that it supports DDoS, or sorry, DOS defense, CPU uh, protection, limit message send rate. It's actually pretty good that way. Um, so this has really good uh, DOS protection. Uh, but where is the, where's the alarm? Ah, the switches feature two separate power input terminals. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm gonna have to check the website, but by the way, this says it'll support a uh, transceiver, a fiber optics transceiver that supports up to 120 kilometers, both single mode or bi-directional. Uh, let me just check on here, one second. We're gonna look up this uh, uh, Titan, and let's see what we've got here for the alarm pins. I'm gonna pull up the manual. Sorry guys, give me a second. Operations manual, that'll help. Ah, here we go. Alarm normally closed. After the alarm is triggered, the alarm output is combined. Alarm normally open. After triggering the alarm, the alarm output is open. Okay, so it is just a, a relay. Now, I'm assuming, I'm assuming that with this little guy here is that I probably have to configure the port, which is why it's not actually doing anything. Yeah, give it one more go. Yeah, because I didn't hear the relay click. Okay, so that has to be configured. That's what, that was my dumb. All right, no big deal. So that's that. Yeah, let's take a look at these ports again. So two powers, uh, power one, power two and your alarm input right there. And look at this big, hefty grounding terminal. That is a nice grounding terminal right there. And uh, I'm not concerned that I just dropped that on my glass desk. This has a rubber mat on it. Uh, also, I don't think I can hurt this switch by tapping it on my desk. So yeah, I mean, even though, by the way, these ports have grounded uh, pins on them, you always wanna make sure that you use proper grounding before. Uh, you wanna intercept, uh, intercept the power before it actually reaches your core equipment. So that's usually done with a, uh, a grounded terminal or patch bay like the um, ones made, I think Tycon makes them. But Mono, uh, Mono Price? Mono Price. I think Mono Price makes them actually. Uh, Mono Price make uh, grounded RJ45 patch panels so you can actually intercept power or you can watch my grounding video where I show you some neat tricks that work incredibly well where you basically bond your double shielded cable the way that you would bond coax that's normally installed on those big cell phone towers so yeah there you go there's a the general overview now we're still going to do the software overview of this guy but we're not going to do it in this video because this video was more or less the uh, let's get inside of it and uh, take a look at the hardware on it so I guess now I'm going to uh, set this thing up so we can go through the software on it and take a look at the software. Okay, there we go. There's our panel ears. That is really handy. Or, you know, again, like I said, you can put this... Uh, I'm not sure I entirely like that one, though. Hold on, let me see something. That's a little DIN rail that'd be right there that it comes with. Personally, I don't know about you, but... And this is no dig on Tycom, by the way, but that little mounting piece works perfectly fine. I think I'll probably end up doing this. Oh yeah, I like that. It's a little bit uh, sexier, no? Oh yeah, I like that one. But the stock one is, there's nothing wrong with it. It's kind of low profile, works nicely, it's elegant. Yeah, there we go. So I hope you guys enjoyed this part of the video. This is the hardware overview, tear down, blah, blah, blah. Taking a look at this awesome device. And you know what, for good measure, I should actually plug an SFP cage into it. Let's see here what I have for optics. You can plug any optics that you want into it. One of my other handy little tricks is this, because then you don't lose a port. There you go. You can plug a couple of RJ45s in there and use those as your uplink ports to your switch or to your router for your router on a stick config. There we go. Let's take a second one and plug it in there. There. Now you've got upstream and downstream. Ha! Handy, eh? And then that gives you eight ports for PoE. Or if you're using this with something like a. Uh, I don't think I've got a 4011 handy, but you could use something like a Microtech RB4011 or um, whatever, and you can actually power it off of one of the AT ports, because the Microtech routers will run on 48 volts AT. Um, so, handy. There you go, guys. I hope that was informative. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks to Dave for our awesome sponsors from Tycon. This is, this is a Tycon device that they sent to me. And uh, don't forget, if you want to help support the channel, um, you can join us on Patreon and help to uh, keep us fed and uh, help the channel grow so we can do better videos. And uh, yeah, because <laughs> God knows I've got some cool things coming. I'm really excited to show you that. So anxiously waiting. Anyway, love you guys. We'll catch you later. Ciao.